Good morning, everyone. Um, so our first um, keynote speaker for uh, today is uh, Professor uh, Mirislo um, Sibniski from uh, University of Maryland. Um, so Professor um, Sibniski is the editor in chief of Automation in Construction Journal that uh, you may already know. Uh, his current research focuses on the creation of technology capability maps of organizations and institutions involved in research, development, technology deployment, and construction project delivery utilizing additive manufacturing, uh, 3D printing solutions worldwide. Prior to his position as chair professor at the University of Maryland, Professor Sibniski was professor at Purdue University at Indiana. Professor Sibniski has held part-time visiting and or honorary professorship at NUS uh, here and NTU here in Singapore, as well as other universities worldwide. He's an author of over 300 publications. He holds an honorary doctorate from VGTU in Lithuania. He was also elected as foreign member of the Russian Academy of Engineering as a full member of the Academy of Engineering in Poland. So please uh, welcome uh, Professor Sibniski. Thank you. Thank you very much. My talk this morning uh, will built uh, on what you have heard uh, during the first day in the conference. Uh, there were uh, many interesting uh, presentations and my uh, story today will not be so much about adding uh, technical content to that uh, what you have heard yesterday but uh, simply building up on it to see how that can be utilized uh, in order to advance the cause of 3D printing applications in construction. So uh, at the University of Maryland uh, in conjunction with uh, Hong Kong uh, University of Science and Technology, we've been putting together a technology capability map in relation to 3D printing in construction. And uh, that map is work in progress. It's by no means finished. In fact, uh, it is very likely to become a mov moving target given the fact that uh, there is so much new development happening. Uh, uh, Professor Koshnevis uh, showed yesterday uh, a diagram, a chart that showed uh, rapid acceleration uh, of new developments in the technology as well as applications of existing technology uh, in uh, various uh, projects and places around the world. So this is a, a rough outline of what I'm going to do. Unfortunately, I have more slides than we can possibly utilize. Uh, for this morning, I only have half an hour uh, for the whole presentation. But uh, I want to uh, uh, skip over, given the, uh, the amount of time that we have, skip over the uh, introduction to printing, uh, 3D printing technology, since uh, uh, we all know uh, what the capabilities are and the classifications of various techniques uh, and uh, what kinds of uh, extrusion materials are being used. Uh, uh, applications are, of course, uh, a very uh, uh, formidable. Uh, one fairly recent example that uh, catches my attention is uh, not so much uh, the application of 3D printing to the uh, production of buildings, uh, but uh, to the service of construction equipment that is very expensive. Uh, uh, just uh, about two years ago, Caterpillar, which is the largest equipment manufacturer for the construction industry in the world, uh, has acquired a 3D printing company for only one purpose, uh, and that is to produce spare parts for very expensive excavators that work on remote project sites. So rather than waiting for that gasket or uh, something rather small and, and, and obvious uh, that needs to be replaced on a large machine uh, and it needs to be shipped from a, a remote location, even overnight shipping uh, may translate into very significant uh, cost, downtime, uh, downtime cost uh, of, uh, of a machine not operating properly and delaying the project. So uh, obviously uh, simple applications like that can make a, a big difference uh, in the business. Uh, you know, the latest craze of course is uh, printing food 
It's uh, not just soft tissues for medical applications like heart valves, uh, but, uh, but also printing uh, uh, beautiful wedding cakes and whatever else. Uh, you, can, uh, you can probably use your imagination to see where, uh, where this technology is heading and uh, what other capabilities will become apparent uh, in, in the future. So uh, there was uh, quite a bit of discussion yesterday about uh, not just the capabilities, but the cost of deploying this technology. Uh, and obviously it is uh, uh, a major barrier, uh, given the fact that there is a, a significant startup cost, um, setup and dismantling cost uh, in relation to any uh, 3D printing equipment uh, for construction sites. And uh, also there is a question of productivity and speed. How quickly can you deliver a product? And uh, with construction projects, uh, facing tight schedules and uh, facing uh, difficulties in relation to uh, perhaps uh, reorganizing or rearranging some uh, resources on the project side, given that multiple trades have to work on the same project at any given site, that becomes uh, uh, a challenge the, that may be insurmountable for uh, most of the contractors uh, to this day. Uh, we uh, in the United States uh, have been using for decades now uh, a classification system that follows so-called master format uh, for all the construction uh, trades. And it, this has been motivated primarily by the needs of cost estimating in construction. So it's uh, called the uh, CSI classification. CSI stands for Construction Specifications Institute. Uh, it's an old organization that has been uh, sort of uh, reinventing itself every couple of decades uh, uh, to better meet the needs uh, of the construction industry. So, so that's, uh, that's what we, uh, uh, we have been uh, deploying when we, when we classify what kinds of construction applications of 3D printing may become viable in the future. We wanted to use the terminology and the classification that is already familiar uh, to construction companies. Uh, again, our purpose is to make sure that uh, technologies that are available today or even those that are only in uh, research and development, but uh, very promising uh, for the near future that these technologies uh, uh, can become better known to the general population of construction contractors. When you look at the uh, construction industry worldwide, in most developed and developing countries is one of the largest contributors to the national economy. In the US for uh, uh, decades, if not for centuries, that was the number one contrib contributor until industries such as healthcare uh, really uh, expanded and uh, increased their costs. Right now, the number one industry in the US, believe it or not, is healthcare uh, industry in terms of contribution to the national economy. Not necessarily always positive. You know, if a number of heart attacks uh, shoots up uh, at, in any given year. The, the significance of that sector of the economy, of course, shoots up uh, again. But construction has always been there uh, at or near the top. So this is uh, uh, these are the standard classifications. Uh, the divisions uh, represent various types of construction work. And uh, we can uh, classify potential applications of 3D printing uh, according to these divisions as well. Uh, as far as the history, uh, of uh, 3D printing in construction, as uh, many speakers indicated yesterday, is, uh, is of course uh, fairly young. Uh, when you look at uh, uh, which, organ or which country actually uh, has the largest number of uh, industry and academic organizations, of course the uh, United States uh, uh, comes to the top. That doesn't necessarily mean that, uh, that the um, types of research and development topics in the U.S are indeed most captivating. In fact, uh, uh, the opposite might be the case. Uh, most of the most publicized application scenarios and uh, cases to date actually come from outside of the US, uh, particularly uh, from Europe, I would say. But then uh, other countries, of course, has been, ha have been active in the field as well. So uh, uh, two, uh, at least to our knowledge, two industry organizations in India are already working on, uh, on uh, 3D uh, printing uh, applications. Uh, actually, there was one at the time when the slide was made. Uh, most recently, I heard about another one. So that uh, uh, illustrates the point that, indeed, it's a, it's a moving target. Uh, 
Where are we heading with this development? Uh, nobody knows really for sure. We can only uh, show what trends exist and uh, to what extent those trends reflect the reality of uh, potential applications uh, uh, in the future. Uh, so you've seen uh, most of these examples that are here on this slide, so no need for me to uh, belabor that. Uh, uh, the, the applications that are uh, most likely to become successful are the ones that, uh, uh, that uh, represent uh, the types of projects of which architects have been dreaming for a long time and contractors have been dreading simply because the formwork technology may be extremely expensive or non-existent. Uh, or um, maybe building codes are not up to speed with the uh, availabilities of new technologies that can deliver products uh, that were beyond the imagination of uh, designers and contractors uh, in, in, in the recent past. So uh, you have a, a number of these developments that uh, uh, have been historically very attractive, but they may be pushed out by some uh, new developments, either due to new materials or new equipment uh, showing up on the market. Uh, 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 this is a, a quote from an African proverb. I don't, I, I don't even know which country it comes from, but uh, uh, I think it has, it has uh, something to do with the reality of where 3D printing is today. Uh, if you want to go fast, go alone, but if you want to go far, uh, you have to go together with, uh, with, other, uh, with other entities. So that brings me to the central point of what I, uh, the, the message that I want to drive uh, today, and that has to do with uh, what potential collaborations may exist and are not happening simply because uh, companies um, and uh, institutions uh, don't know about one another, that they're also working on, on complementary uh, capabilities in 3D printing, or if they do know, uh, they see some institutional complications, or maybe they're afraid or, or uh, to uh, consider uh, a joint venture uh, to pursue a development uh, together, or maybe there is a geographic distance uh, or logistical issues or personnel issues uh, that prevent them uh, from, from doing that. Uh, so there are um, some examples, very limited examples of partnerships among companies uh, that uh, are already uh, pre-existing. Uh, some in the US, uh, uh, there is even one example we could find from Singapore and that is a partnership between this institution and Ham Hamilton Labs. Uh, but there are some others uh, uh, in, uh, in Europe, for example, the, the one that is probably most publicized is uh, uh, Gramatio Color Architects and uh, ETH. Uh, this is a German acronym, of course. It's Eidgenossische Technische Hochschule uh, in, in Zurich. Um, and uh, some partnerships uh, are beginning to spring up in uh, uh, some of the least likely places. Uh, I, I have just, uh, I traveled uh, uh, to our conference here uh, yesterday in the morning. I came straight from Europe and I was at in attendance at the Creative Construction Conference. And uh, I heard from uh, a company in uh, Lima, Peru, in South America, and, uh, and the university in Chile about a new partnership being formed uh, uh, to pursue a joint project uh, related to 3D printing. Uh, so uh, even in, in seemingly remote parts of the world that uh, are not uh, particularly famous uh, for innovation in the construction technology, you have interest and you have uh, a desire and capability uh, to, uh, to pursue these projects jointly. So uh, is this list exhaustive? Of course not. You uh, people in the audience uh, may, may know of uh, many more that are happening. Nevertheless, uh, it has not yet become a trend. Uh, so uh, this is uh, what we are trying to do with our uh, technology capability map. We want to create an interactive uh, screen where uh, either companies or organizations can actually visualize uh, where these potential relationships may actually exist. Uh, and uh, our goal is uh, not only to document uh, the existing partnerships and, and uh, take stock of them, uh, but also uh, to analyze capabilities of uh, individual organizations that are active in this area 
and propose to them, uh, or at least suggest, uh, where part new partnerships might be considered. Uh, so there are, uh, of course, uh, some success stories and maybe uh, some stories of uh, attempted partnerships uh, that have not worked out very well uh, for one reason or another, uh, or some short-lived partnerships that may have worked uh, well for one project, but perhaps uh, there were no significant lessons learned and therefore uh, parties decided to uh, go their, in their own separate directions. Uh, uh, someone yesterday mentioned to me the, the story of the uh, Dubai Future Foundation and uh, Winston from China uh, that was also trying to form a partnership to pursue uh, several joint projects together. Um, that partnership, uh, to my knowledge, is somewhat silent at this point in time. Uh, however, there, there might be some new developments uh, in the near future uh, as well. Uh, there are some uh, interesting partnerships uh, between uh, several construction companies and uh, technology developments in Russia, uh, uh, namely uh, for the development of housing projects, of housing units. Uh, uh, Spekavia, for example, in the city of uh, Yaroslav in, in Russia. Uh, is, uh, is one of those new examples that uh, uh, creates some potential uh, for other markets and other applications as well. Uh, uh, in Copenhagen, uh, Denmark, there is a new initiative. Uh, by the way, last February there was a, a domestic national uh, conference uh, for contractors uh, in Denmark. The whole conference was, er, it was run in Danish, so uh, people not familiar with the Danish language would probably not be preview to uh, what uh, went on at that conference, but uh, very serious discussions among potential business partnerships, uh, among contractors of various specialties uh, uh, were conducted and some new initiatives uh, uh, were proposed to the government to try uh, fusion of capabilities of various technologies uh, for projects that would be financed by the Danish government for, for public buildings. Uh, uh, Russia being as large as it is, of course, uh, presents a, a, a logistical uh, challenge uh, due to transportation of these uh, components that may be uh, manufactured in one location and uh, with a need to be shipped uh, uh, across the country uh, for thousands of miles, for example. But there are also some new partnerships being formed uh, among Danish uh, technology developers uh, and Danish contractors discussed uh, potential for applying this technology uh, across Russia as well. So uh, there are uh, spectacular examples of uh, projects that may have benefited uh, from partnerships and maybe uh, they were spectacular enough uh, in their own right but could have become even more spectacular if uh, such partnerships were formed uh, and uh, there's a lot of what if uh, stories uh, being presented around the world. What if that particular project was conducted uh, with a material that uh, wasn't available uh, to the contractor at the time, but it could have been used uh, on the same project uh, uh, if the companies uh, decided to form such partnerships. So uh, many, many such examples uh, throughout the world. Uh, uh, there is, a, for example, a, a consortium of companies uh, uh, primarily driven by uh, entities inside Netherlands, uh, but uh, also involving other uh, companies throughout Europe. Uh, to uh, come up with uh, projects for uh, very progressive, uh, future-oriented uh, architectural design firms that are interested in uh, free-form uh, architectural shapes, where uh, formwork, of course, is either non-existent uh, on a standardized basis uh, or needs to be uh, fabricated uh, uh, from, you know, using 3D printing te technology itself. Uh, very thin uh, shell structures uh, from uh, concrete uh, for a variety of public buildings. Uh, in um, South Africa, there is a, a discussion about a new partnership between WITS, that's WITS Batersrand University uh, in Johannesburg, and uh, two construction companies that are uh, discussing with the uh, public roads department in South Africa 
uh, for uh, discussing the potential for uh, uh, very innovative shapes for uh, uh, rest stops uh, on national highways. Uh, such uh, projects have been contemplated and in fact uh, tried uh, in the United States and Canada uh, over the years, but uh, with uh, limited results uh, to this point. Uh, so uh, these are just some of the examples of uh, what, what is happening uh, uh, around the world. Uh, uh, Deuce Architects, that, that firm is known uh, in, in the business and uh, uh, for their interest in a variety of innovative projects as well. Uh, branch technology, I'm just uh, uh, showing uh, some of these examples of uh, what's going on. The bottom line is that uh, we have identified to this date, a uh, little over 200 companies uh, throughout the world uh, that are pursuing projects using uh, some aspects of uh, 3D printing uh, technology in their projects. Uh, and uh, also companies that are doing, uh, uh, that are providing services uh, to contractors interested in, in these types of technologies. Uh, they may be consulting companies, they're not really producing any particular product themselves, but they provide expertise uh, to integrate uh, technologies uh, in, in, uh, uh, in various parts of the world. Uh, so we have uh, embarked on a survey, uh, a worldwide survey of uh, 3D printing technology capabilities among construction companies as well as R&D organizations. Uh, some of you have already received that questionnaire from us. Uh, and uh, some who haven't, uh, I'd be delighted to hear from you after this presentation. If you could give me your card and uh, we can send that survey to you. Uh, we're trying to enlarge this map and, and keep it as, as much up to date as uh, we possibly can. So uh, it's not a very long survey, it takes about 20 minutes to fill out. It's uh, purely online, so you just click on the link and then uh, we're able to uh, augment our results uh, as soon as we receive uh, your submission. Uh, so uh, the classification of 3D printed uh, products uh, uh, is uh, something that we aim at uh, in order to come up with uh, results that would be understandable and, and useful for everyone concerned, uh, that classification was necessary. So we, we had the uh, the classification of products, we had uh, the classification of organizations, and uh, that allowed us to uh, create this uh, capability map. So uh, this is uh, where we are at this point in time. Um, Svetlana, my assistant, uh, who has just returned from Maryland uh, to uh, Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, uh, is uh, now collaborating uh, uh, with the computer scientist uh, who is uh, making this map uh, highly interactive. Uh, and uh, ultimately, you would like uh, for this to be a multimedia document, or you, you'd be able to click on, uh, on icons representing companies. You should be able to see examples of their projects, maybe videos of uh, projects uh, underway, uh, and uh, detailed classifications of what they represent. And uh, from that will come uh, an opportunity to, to make suggestions uh, to, to other entities uh, that are also on the map in case uh, there is a potential project that can be uh, pursued uh, jointly. So uh, that brings uh, uh, me to, to my last point that I want to make, uh, that this technology capability map uh, is not an end uh, in itself. The reason why we want to do that is to think about what will happen next. Uh, currently, we have uh, significant capabilities in the industry uh, with respect to materials, to uh, equipment, and technology in general. Uh, what we don't have uh, is a, a, a robust and mature supply chain of products and services related to 3D printing technologies uh, that uh, will accelerate the use of the technology uh, in the construction industry. Uh, we don't necessarily aim at developing a brand new supply chain of uh, operating in a vacuum. We'd like to first see how feasible it is to uh, fit uh, products and services that are related to 3D printing technologies into the existing supply chains, which are very robust and, and very mature uh, in various parts of the world and what difference 
these products and services can make in those existing supply chains. Uh, that, so that's really the, the, the purpose of this whole, uh, of this whole activity. Um, again, it's a it's work in progress. Uh, we don't know how these supply chains will look like. We don't know whether they will be localized or they will uh, be global. Uh, hopefully, at some point in time, these chains will become global and they will make a significant impact uh, on the construction industry worldwide. Uh, the, the ultimate step would be to create a tool that will allow us to optimize these supply chains and manage them to the point that uh, new entrants into the industry will be readily accommodated. Uh, they will not have to uh, overcome ins insurmountable barriers uh, that uh, some of the uh, existing suppliers, the purveyors of this technology are facing right now. Uh, so there are numerous issues that need to be uh, uh, resolved. Uh, uh, construction industry, of course, has been notorious and very well known for uh, amount of waste that it generates. Uh, it's no secret that uh, in just about any municipal waste site, uh, uh, 60 to 70 percent of the total volume of uh, solid waste is construction related. It's either spent concrete or, uh, or steel or uh, plastics or wood, you name it. Uh, even uh, metals uh, that haven't been separated. Uh, 3D printing technology uh, has a promise to significantly reduce that waste. Uh, will it actually happen? Once we are able to fit in uh, these products and services into the existing supply chains, remains to be seen. But it, uh, it could become uh, a research study for somebody interested in a PhD on the topic. What's the impact of 3D printing technology on waste minimization in, in the construction industry? Uh, and there are numerous projects that can come out of this general framework that we're trying to create. Uh, there is really a, uh, a need for an effective uh, coordination and collaboration uh, system uh, among researchers and technology purveyors uh, that uh, uh, that now we collectively have to think about. Uh, and it's people like you, people in the audience, who are familiar with this technology, who are familiar with our industry, that need to start thinking about uh, where these connections uh, will happen. So, uh, I know I've been given only half an hour for the presentation and 10 minutes uh, for, uh, for questions and answers. I'll, it's probably a good point to stop here uh, although I still have quite a few more slides to show if for anyone interested. By the way, I understand that all the slides will be available to all participants of the conference, so uh, uh, please stay tuned for uh, any new developments uh, on, on our issues. And uh, do give me your uh, business card uh, if, uh, if you are able to uh, respond to our survey. Thank you very much. Testing. Okay, thank you for sure. Prof. Uh, so I think we come to Q&A sessions. So question please. Uh, please uh, now. Hi, it was nice meeting yesterday and we already spoke. I just want to say that I covered in my PhD most of the research questions you have. So life cycle assessment that includes supply chain and I compare additive manufacturing with conventional manufacturing and I found 727 systems. Of course, maybe they overlap with yours, 180, or they can be combined. I'll be happy to give you my research so you can continue on that. And I analyzed applicability. I analyzed cost, schedule, basically time required for manufacturing, and uh, environmental impacts, which include supply chain, compared to conventional manufacturing, where user can input any parameter they want. Mm -hmm. I'll be happy to share that. Just Thank you. Uh, that's very valuable. Uh, we, uh, when we looked at uh, technologies, uh, uh, we looked uh, at them more holistically. We looked at uh, potential applications to the types of projects that contractors are currently pursuing or interested in. Uh, your study was probably at the more the, the, the granularity uh, of the information that you are looking for uh, was probably more detailed. Uh, our uh, interest is in uh, proposing a, a strategy, uh, how these supply chains can be created and then how they can be integrated uh, with the existing ones uh, so that uh, the industry can, can benefit. But uh, 
absolutely uh, what you have done uh, would be invaluable uh, to the progress of our study as well. So thanks. Okay, um, I I'm chairing Jackie. <laughs> so, um, yeah, any more questions? Yeah. Uh, we are uh, developing that list right now. Uh, it's it's not uh, ready, but it's certainly uh, something that we are definitely uh, interested in uh, seeing developed as a part of our study as well. Uh, to uh, one example that uh, I was just mentioning in passing yesterday was that uh, uh, window frame manufacturers are, are interested. Uh, companies such as Pella Windows uh, in the US uh, and uh, uh, a few others are interested in seeing the potential of the technology. Uh, uh, window frames are becoming increasingly expensive uh, and uh, the demand for them uh, has skyrocketed, especially the, the ones that uh, are connected with uh, energy efficient uh, building systems. What's the impact of that technology on uh, producing integrated uh, wall panel and window frame systems, how can they be printed together and installed seamlessly? Um, and and uh, so what's the impact uh, of the technology on uh, energy efficiency in buildings, for example? Uh, so lots of issues that actually uh, come up as we start looking at other, uh, other companies and their needs. Uh, uh, spare parts industry uh, for, as I mentioned, equipment, uh, Caterpillar uh, being interested in that. Uh, um, nuclear uh, power industry uh, interest is, is very interested in potential for uh, 3D printing products and services for uh, reactor containment buildings, uh, especially for maintenance and, and replacement of uh, spare components of containment buildings uh, that have to be uh, inspected to extremely strict specifications and standards. Uh, NRC, Nuclear Regulatory Commission in the U.S., is, uh, is extremely uh, uh, strict about that. And uh, so there is interest uh, among uh, nuclear power plant operators uh, as well. Uh, so many, many other. Uh, but the, the list of needs uh, uh, will always be a moving target. <laughs> I'm not personally familiar with uh, any solution being uh, offered uh, in this industry, but uh, it's certainly one of those potential applications that uh, that might be uh, interesting. There is the uh, that uh, footbridge uh, in the Netherlands uh, that has been widely publicized. You see a lot of videos on YouTube uh, on that. Uh, that, uh, that is the only example that comes to mind. Uh, but there may be others uh, springing up in the next couple of years. So uh, space roofs uh, obviously uh, would be in that category as well. So uh, th there's obviously a potential. You said Arab, right? Uh, has, has developed that uh, specification. So uh, that would be the go-to company to uh, to see where the technology is at this point, how to take it from there. There's an Arab uh, representative here. You can. Ah yes. Okay. Excellent. So you know about this? Yes. Yeah. 
later she will Okay, go good, later. good. Uh, a uh, in one of the slides, uh, there is, there is, this shows the, the research versus the construction. Mm -hmm. And there's a comparison between, uh, say, US and Spain on one side and we and Italy on the other side. What is the best combination from your experience? Do you recommend that a country goes through the research and then they, through the development, or it just kind of uh, gets straight to the development? Uh, the right now we have we have been observing uh, the uh, the the impetus uh, for new development uh, for various challenging manufacturing tasks uh, and uh, the technologies that have been proven effective in manufacturing uh, have been considered for construction applications. Uh, I'm not personally familiar with any technology that has been developed strictly for construction use, uh, construction industry use, so there hasn't been, to my knowledge, a technology transfer in the other direction. Uh, as far as uh, collaboration between various countries, uh, it, it's been highly opportunistic. Uh, uh, there is this technology that uh, catches the, uh, the attention of a, of a potential user in a country like UAE. Uh, they've been accustomed to buying things up uh, and, and, and simply uh, approaching the technology vendors or developers and saying, how about applying it on my project? Uh, or just buying in, entire technological solutions and then uh, adopting them in that particular country. Uh, uh, the more sustainable approach, of course, is to develop that capability domestically uh, and uh, be able to use it uh, for your own domestic industry rather than importing these uh, solutions from other places. Few countries can actually afford that. The UAE is one of those few. Um, I have a couple of uh, questions. Uh, okay. yes. see. Um, you mentioned about uh, waste minimization potentials of uh, 3D printing. How about uh, design for deconstruction of uh, 3D printed constructions. That means waste of 3D printing itself. If you have planned for deconstructing, do you have any research in that? Second question um, is regarding, is there any research with respect to furnitures and fix, fixtures inside the build, building with 3D printed? Maybe IKEA, those kind of, kind of companies may be interested. So, if I understand the first question is, uh, are there any particular aspects of design? Of design for deconstruction or demolition after oh, deconstruction? Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I, I don't really know, I'm not familiar with, uh, with any examples of projects in which 3D printing would be used for deconstruction, but that's an interesting uh, concept. Of course, uh, deconstruction, so demolition, is, uh, is, uh, is maybe the largest contributor to, uh, to that uh, waste generation uh, by the construction industry. Because waste separation is just, the technology is, uh, is not uh, universally uh, adopted uh, around the world. Most of that waste is just piled up uh, in, uh, in waste sites. Uh, now, what would be the impact of, uh, of uh, 3D printing on future waste generation when these structures need to be demolished, nobody knows. We, we simply don't have any experience uh, with them. Uh, the big challenge is that uh, uh, building codes in most countries, if not all, are not up to speed uh, with the technology. So therefore, uh, there are really no specifications uh, developed uh, yet based, on, based in response to building code requirements. Uh, so that's still work for the future. Another uh, topic for somebody's research should be uh, uh, take an inventory of uh, those impediments in existing uh, building design codes and see how they can be addressed uh, in order to accommodate the, the use of 3D printing technology. Uh, no one, to my knowledge, has taken the inventory of those problems that exist. Uh, there are lots of issues that uh, still haven't been uh, uh, decided. Uh, and I already forgot your second question. <laughs> uh, second question is regarding 3D printing of furniture and fixing like this. Oh, so, furniture. Yeah. 
so th there is, uh, I, I haven't really uh, specifically addressed the issues of furniture, but uh, furniture is obviously a, a significant potential as well. Uh, in uh, fixed furniture, you mean, right? Uh, in, yeah. in, in existing uh, uh, spaces. Uh, sky is the limit as to what you can do. Uh, yeah, a lot of logistics and, can And there is far less regulations, uh, except for public spaces, but for personal spaces, uh, you can use your imagination and there is very little regulation as to uh, what, what you can or cannot do. Okay, uh, this is the last question from Professor Koshnovis and yeah. Uh, very interesting question. I, I remember, yes, uh, I'm old enough to remember that we were making promises uh, in the 1980s that by the year 2000, surely, uh, robots will be running on construction job sites uh, everywhere around the world. Uh, and this is fast forward to 2018 and uh, it's, we're nowhere near uh, that scenario. Uh, the reasons are many. Uh, one is the fact that uh, uh, there was and there still is a, a, a very large fragmentation uh, in the industry. So in any project you have conflicting interests uh, among various parties, general contractors, subcontractors, suppliers. Uh, so it's just lack of coordination. And that lack of coordination was at that time in the 1980s and 90s where Actually, especially in the 1980s, where the Japanese systems were being developed by companies such as uh, uh, Obayashi, Shimizu, Kajima, Takenaka, uh, Taisei, uh, you, you name it. Uh, there was uh, probably a dozen contractors that developed very similar systems, especially for high-rise building construction and for a single application. Uh, there was almost no collaboration among those companies. They were fiercely competitive. Uh, and there came this recession in Japan that lasted for over two decades. Uh, so uh, these very large construction organizations like Obayashi, for example, I, I worked for them for seven years off and on, uh, on, on various projects. Uh, uh, they had uh, pretty close to a hundred million dollar budget for R&D. Uh, so very large institute uh, with hundreds of engineers working on technology development projects. That got slashed as soon as the economy took a nosedive in Japan. Uh, these people went into production uh, departments of the company. Uh, and um, most, if not all, of these projects uh, in, in that one company, and Shimizu was no different, uh, were halted. Uh, so that's one reason. And, and uh, the other, the technological reason is that, that fragmentation could be, couldn't be overcome at that time by existing design, construction, uh, integration solutions. So keep in mind, so that was before building information modeling. Now we have BIM, which is uh, widely used in industry now, so we have better coordination. We have now the capability of something that didn't exist. 20 years ago, I had a master's student uh, in my lab at Purdue that used AutoCAD uh, to uh, design a, a simple experiment with a laboratory robot that would perform an excavation task directly uh, with direct input from uh, an AutoCAD drawing uh, into the robot controller. Uh, that was wild idea uh, at the time. Uh, now it's entirely possible. Uh, you, you can do uh, such things with BIM. It's conceivable that you would have uh, a BIM file that could become an input uh, into a robotic controller or a 3D printer. Uh, so those things are possible. Uh, and there are other reasons uh, for a combination of factors uh, as well. Uh, mostly uh, inability of vendors to come up with a business case uh, that uh, uh, a particular application would be a large enough volume for them to, uh, uh, to warrant uh, 
further implementation uh, of the technology. So those promises that we were making in the 1980s about the technology are about to reappear uh, or to be reinvented uh, maybe in the new context. Uh, see what's happening with artificial intelligence in general. Uh, uh, I was uh, a, a graduate student in maybe what was the first class ever taught on the application of expert systems in civil engineering but Professor Stephen Fenbus, who is now long retired, uh, but he was a, a, a precursor of the application of this technology uh, in, in civil engineering design uh, profession. And uh, there was very little uptake of that technology by the industry at that time. Uh, but look what's happening now. Uh, commodity, you know, the routine design tasks have become commodity. Uh, design houses, the design organizations, almost none of them do routine design in-house anymore. It's all farmed out to uh, cheap labor countries. Uh, it could be uh, India, could be Romania, could be uh, some other country in the world where you have very highly skilled engineers uh, working for a fraction of the cost of what it costs in Los Angeles or San Francisco. Um, so, yeah, that's a, that's a long answer to a short question. But, uh, yeah, but, I think we. Uh, now that the economy is back to Japan, now that we have been those impressive technologies that the Japanese developed, are they going to come back now? Uh, well, because you said one reason was the bad economy at the time, and the other reason is that now we have been, which facilitates the process. I think so, and now we have three D printing, uh, which we didn't have. So there is a there, a lot of those solutions that were invented at that time have a strong potential for a comeback uh, in, in, a, in a reinvented uh, mode. Uh, so certainly embellished with uh, the, the current capabilities created by BIM and okay. uh, 3D printing. I think uh, we have gone well over time, okay. but it's been a very, very stimulating discussion. And Professor Simnik created a lot of uh, uh, ideas for you to discuss and I can see that you want to ask more questions but uh, maybe you can discuss it during the day uh, at uh, coffee and lunch time. So um, let's um, um, uh, give a presentation to Professor uh, Steve Niski uh, according Thank to you. Singaporean custom. Oh. <laughs> okay. Uh, Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.